Hello, I'm Cherry and George, and it's my pleasure to contribute to the series of human stories. One disturbing strand in the story of the human species is intolerance of difference. I'd like to talk to you about hate, not at the interpersonal level of human relations, but on a more organized industrial scale. I define hate propaganda as sustained, coordinated communication campaigns that aim to justify discrimination or even incite violence against at-risk communities, mostly by essentializing them as inferior, alien, or even dangerous. Hate propaganda has laid the ground for centuries of genocide, imperial conquest, enslavement, and settler colonialism. It continues to facilitate injustices against minorities of all kinds around the world. It's an age-old and global phenomenon for which there is no ultimate solution, but perhaps we can grow smarter at dealing with it and thus reduce the harm it causes to vulnerable groups. It's important to understand hate propaganda as a sophisticated political strategy. Hate is an intense emotional reaction that is often irrational, but we shouldn't think that political actors who harness this force are incapable of cold calculation. Love conquers hate, but countering hate propaganda requires more than just good hearts. My own research on this topic is written up in several publications that are listed on the webpage beneath this video, but in this presentation, I'll just highlight five points. First, freedom of expression is a basic human right, but this right is not unlimited and does not extend to the kind of speech that concerns us here. In fact, Article 20 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights obliges states to prohibit expression that amounts to an incitement to hatred. Though the legal thresholds vary, liberal democracies generally don't permit incitement to hate crimes. Even when hard law errs on the side of free speech, a long-standing human rights doctrine requires soft law, a self-regulation, editorial judgment, and social norms uh, to do the important work of pushing discriminatory speech out to the fringes of social life. While liberalism uh, famously advocates freedom for the thoughts we hate, this principle does not extend to license for the rot of hate. Second, hate propaganda is more than so-called fake news. Uh, hate campaigns always include an element of disinformation. Sometimes they use outright fraud. Uh, think of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, a document completely fabricated to add weight to the conspiracy theory that Jews were planning to take over the world. Digital media have multiplied exponentially the opportunity to tell lies about vulnerable groups. In response, there are many ongoing projects to improve fact-checking, including by, by using artificial intelligence, and these should help detect fraudulent content. But fact-checking is powerless against the most basic untruth on which all hate propaganda is built, the big lie that only one identity counts. We are white, they are coloured. We are Hindu, they are Muslim. We are locals, they are foreign. Such categorizations have come to seem natural and commonsensical, which is why they are fact-check proof. Hate campaigns harden chosen us and them categories as if these identities alone define their societies. That's the confidence trick, robbing people of other meaningful cross-cutting identities as fellow workers, as neighbours, as citizens, and as human beings. Once a supreme and singular identity is successfully sold, hate propaganda doesn't actually require much of so-called fake news. It can use legends and songs and symbols and even science. It can use factual news from credible sources, but maliciously selected, such as crime stories where the victim is one of us and the perpetrator is one of them, to spread fear and loathing. Third, hate propaganda is more than hate speech. 
vilifying an ethnic or other identity group in order to deny it equal rights. Like if a leader says people of that race are uncivilized and shouldn't live among us. Such in-your-face hate speech has, thankfully, become socially less acceptable and, in many jurisdictions, illegal. Agents of hate, therefore, have adopted a more backdoor approach where they play the victim rather than the oppressor. They whip up indignation and outrage against some perceived offence against their in-group, which they claim has been caused by the out-group. Such manufacture of offence is an extremely versatile tactic. The trigger could be a movie, a cartoon, a book, a building, any cultural product that can be interpreted as yet another symbol of injustice or of looming danger. Major hate campaigns tend to use both conventional incitement as well as manufactured indignation, a potent strategy that I've called hate spin. Since offence is highly subjective, it is almost impossible to neutralise it when it's deliberately taken for political advantage. Indeed, attempts to diffuse the situation by appealing to reason can themselves be exploited by hate spin agents as further evidence that the in-group is a victim of an unjust system that is rigged by the out-group. Fourth, the most effective hate spin is layered and distributed. There is a division of labour within a loosely coordinated movement. The most direct and incendiary messages are communicated by extreme activists and preachers and their media, but uh, these movements might also include think tanks and commentators who churn out pseudo-intellectual talking points while superficially observing norms of reason and civility. Supportive mainstream news organizations, meanwhile, provide a kind of information laundering service, normalizing discriminatory view worldviews in the course of seemingly objective reporting. This modern supply chain for hate also employs mercenary professional services. Public relations and marketing consultants help in the design and execution of major campaigns, and it has become abundantly clear that the big lie that I referred to earlier, dividing people into easily manipulable groups, has been knowingly facilitated by internet platforms such as Facebook. At the apex of these networks, prominent political leaders can keep their hands relatively clean, engaging in occasional dog whistles or simply maintaining an eloquent silence when hate crimes occur. They leave it to the audience to pull together the distributed and layered bits to create hateful meanings within their heads. Fifth, as a result of these attributes that I've mentioned, the Cleverous hate campaigns are highly resistant to regulation. Democracy's laws against hate speech tend to be powerless when hate spin doesn't cross the line of incitement. Furthermore, such laws only work well when there is a direct cause and effect connection between an isolated speech act and measurable harm. When the message is instead distributed and layered with no obvious conductor, it can become impossible for prosecutors to prove liability. Furthermore, censorship can actually play into the hands of hate agents. When a liberal publisher or regulator blocks an overtly anti-immigrant poster, for example, the hate propagandist can mock the decision as an example of ruling elites who have succumbed to political correctness and thus fail to defend the nation against the invaders. Indeed, controversies around a cancelled campaign can have a bigger publicity payoff than the campaign itself. Not surprisingly, therefore, some hate campaigns are designed as booby traps to bait liberal outrage. Outside of liberal democracies, many countries try to regulate not just incitement but also hurtful and offensive speech, thinking that this will ensure harmony. This too can backfire badly since the most intolerant elements in society are the ones most likely to claim to be offended by others' innocent speech and conduct. In countries that criminalize blasphemy and the wounding of racial and religious feelings, extreme segments of the majority community regularly exploit such laws to persecute minorities. What then can states do? 
The most promising approaches, I suggest, are not directed at individual instances of dangerous speech, but instead try to address hate propaganda at a more systemic level. Social media platforms do need to be regulated more strictly, but too much attention is being focused on moderating individual instances of toxic speech. The more serious problem is these companies' underlying business model of dividing the public into algorithmically constructed subgroups for covert micro-targeting. Us and them divisions are as old as time, but today's digital platforms are the first communication technologies in history that come encoded with the means to activate and manipulate differences at the behest of the highest bidder. At the same time, we need much bigger investments in media that cut across such divisions by promoting inclusivity and other civic values. Most countries are desperately short of spaces and that are dedicated to deliberation across culture and interests. This is a role that could be played by public service media run by professional journalists who are both free from government control and independent of commercial interests. Traditional public service broadcasters like those found in Western and Northern Europe are one model. Other private sector decentralized models could serve similar purposes. Whatever the precise institutional arrangements though, the policy objective must be to build societal resistance against hate propaganda by cultivating more fluid and open identities and a clearer understanding of our collective destinies. Thank you. And lie to you and yours. So I, I, you know, I sometimes do this and do that.